This is Comet Picks by the Glick. Yeah, I'm your host, Jason Glick. Hey, Jason Glick, what's going on? Oh, not a lot, John. It's like, it's just like, you know, business as usual over here. It's like, another week, hey, another big Marvel event. It's yeah. Like, yep. It's like, this time we're talking about um, Absolute Carnage, and, like, because, like, I... Like don't have like the like, the strongest attachment to um you know like the the characters involved in this. I decided to like bring in someone who actually does have more more history with this. And like, hey, Myron. Hey, kids. Going? It's Myron. I'm doing pretty <laughs> good. Yeah. Thanks. For, so, thanks for having me on this week again. Hey, it's always good to have have you back because you know it's like, hey, when I say like, hey, let's talk about Venom, I'm like, okay, yeah, he was created by Todd McFarlane and David Michelini back in the '90s, so. And um, this is and reading the, this current Venom series that led into Absolute Carnage. This is like the most involvement with Venom that I've that I've had, like you know, ever. Hey, so. but he's but he's always been he's always been that kind of like cool Spider-Man character that everybody loved. Uh, that that kind of good like that villain back in the '90s, '80s, and '90s that you know you always wanted to see because he was almost you know the ant. Antithesis to to Spider Man, you know, having his abilities and being able to evade his spider sense, like he was just that menacing villain you always wanted to see within the pages. So, um, yeah, I was I was really stoked to see this relaunch and uh, relaunch of Venom, and not only that, this relaunch of uh, a particular story we're going to be talking about right now. Yeah, because I mean, that's because I mean, Venom's origin is like he—he's basically like uh, the, uh, the the symbiotic spot, like spider costume that that Peter Parker got in the Secret Wars crossover, but then he eventually got rid of it, and then it wound up falling onto this other guy, um, like like a photographer Eddie Brock, who had this long time beef with Peter Parker, so they became Venom, which was like this like evil Spider-Man. It's like, and he and thanks to uh, you know like that that idea plus McFarlane's art, it's like in the nineties he became like hugely popular it's mm-hmm. like yes yeah, like popular to the point where it's like you know he was a villain who was getting his own like regular series of miniseries as well to the point where like you know fans just could not get enough of him like i'm right right about am i right about this myron yeah you're absolutely right because i mean um having his own series he he you know he started off as a villain and getting his own series is kind of like an anti-hero and then of course as you have kids you know uh draw draw to the character and draw to venom it's like oh well maybe we need to kind of hero him up a little bit make him a little bit more of a good guy because we can't have this guy eating brains and intestines all the time so um he's kind of he's kind of broken out of the 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 mold of like that that violent uh villain for spider-man and kind of become a reluctant ally um so i really at, at first like i wasn't really like hot on the idea but you know i love the character so much and they've done so much uh with not only the venom symbiote throughout the years but eddie brock as a character um i really i really dig what they have done with him and especially um what i've read so far in this uh this last miniseries we're about to talk about i the dynamic between eddie brock and peter parker has totally changed to where it kind of threw me aback at first but i really do uh like what they what they've done with their relationship yeah they don't they don't necessarily like each other a whole lot but they can work together it's like when when the needs demand it but um one of the things that that i wanted to get at with them talking about like you know venom's huge popularity is that you know like Make that that whole shift in becoming more of an anti-hero than like either straight up villain or a pure hero, but you know with that shift comes like hey you know it's like we've got this like idea in the sense that hey you know we've got this like alien spot like Spider-Man suit like a symbiote, it's like you know well it's like if the if um our if like the main guy who is this isn't like a pure villain anymore well why don't, why don't we get like someone who make one of these who is a pure villain. And that's kind of how we get to Carnage, I imagine, because like you know he's like basically like a, a serial killer who gets um, so he gets the uh, he gets his own symbiote. I'm um, Cletus Cassidy. It's like he gets the he gets the Carnage sim- symbiote costume at some point. And that's how we got you know Maximum Carnage in the '90s. Yep, and just imagine the power of the symbiote tied to the sick demented mind of a serial killer such as cletus cassidy and it's crazy how that all went down with eddie brock being locked up in the same cell as cletus the symbiote breaking him out and the symbiote leaving a spawn 
uh, behind that it bonds to Cletus and just creates this monstrosity on Earth that has no remorse or no um, conscience when it comes to other lives. And that's where we first get introduced to uh, uh, we get introduced to Carnage and Amazing Spider-Man uh, 361, but then the first big event we see Carnage's, uh, I guess, monstrous carnival is Maximum Carnage in the 90s. Yep, so po- popular enough to get its own video game on the Super Nintendo. With the red cartridge, if you were lucky enough to get one. Yeah, so again, you know, Carn- and, uh, Carnage is popular popular for a while as well. It's like, and you know, this, like, all, I mean, like, for me, it's like, it's kind of, like, I was never like, like huge Spider-Man fan, I guess until like you know Bendis started running Ultimate Spider-Man, and then I eventually got into like um Dan Slott's run in the latter day. But I guess like fast forwarding through a lot of symbiote-related business over the years, it's like my uh, my most memorable encounter with Carnage was when um, Norman Osborn wound up with his symbiote for the last arc of of um Slott's run. So and he became the Red Goblin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that that was a hell of a storyline where it's like Slot did a great job of make, of um, portraying the Red Goblin as like this unstoppable force of nature that um everyone it's like like tried to team up and stop, and that in the end Peter was only able to stop him by attack by going at him laterally by basically telling Nor- Norman like hey okay fine yeah you can kill me right now but you know hey everyone's gonna know that it wasn't you who did it it was it was Carnage it was Cletus Cassidy who helped you and that. And that drove Norman nuts to the point where he yanked off the symbiote and tried to beat Peter barehanded, and that didn't work out all that well. To the point where he wound up, he wound up um, like nuts in the. He wound up be he wound up cra- caught an explosion that that knocked him and the symbiote out and caused him to be nuts in the uh, in the Ravencroft Asylum, which is kind of where we find him, like in this, it's like in this crossover, and I guess. Um, as far as the uh, the current Venom series goes, this is, um, comes to us mainly from Donnie, Donnie Cates and Ryan Stegman, and um, pe- longtime um, listeners of the like and readers of, listeners of the podcast and readers of the blog will probably know that I that I like I like Donnie Cates. It's like he's been doing he's been one of like the bit the the new big guys. It's like in the industry and at Marvel specifically because after his big success at Image with the miniseries God Country, it's like Marvel made a made a concerted effort to snap him up. And um, when when they did, they gave him okay. We're they gave him the uh, final six issues of the Thanos series to write because they figured okay, well we're gonna cancel this anyway, but let's see what he can do with it. And holy shit, man! It's like he turned like these like last six issues of Thanos into an event to the point where like the like his first issue racked up like reprints on reprints and um made actually made that like this like um, this run of Thanos actually hot again and gave us um the cosmic Ghost Rider. You know Frank. Frank Castle as Ghost Rider with the uh, cosmic powers of, it's like of of, Gla- of of a Galactus Herald working for Thanos, and that's and that's kind of craziness that you can expect with with him. It's like and and with Venom, it's like he like with the series with his um first co- first two volumes of Venom, he he also does mi- some pretty significant revisions to Venom's history as well, basically establishing the uh, planet of the symbiosis as being a uh, prison. For this, for the symbiote's go- god, um, Null, it's like this. E- it's like this evil god from, like, like from the dark end of dark end of time, who was just, who was trying to rule everything, and was eventually, um, like, caged by caged by his creations. However, his um his dragon, the Grendel, um, tried to wake him up back in the first in the first arc, but um Eddie and Venom man- barely managed to uh, stop him there. But um, the problem is problem set in the second volume when um when eddie and it's like when eddie and venom basically find like we're where i'm trying to sort things out after that arc and he found that hey you know it's like i've got a i've got a son this kid na- this kid named dylan it's like and eddie's trying to um make things work with his with his dad and all his dad who's had who has had who's, he's never had a good relationship with him with him and all it's like in the sense that his dad was always concerned about appearances and he tried to uh you know and he basically fix, like like fixed this automobile accident that that Eddie was in to make it look like oh no he wasn't like he didn't actually kill this kid it was just it's like it was just an accident and all so that was so they had to, so he had to deal with that but as well as the fact that the uh, symbiote was also manipulating um Eddie's memories as far as you know 
as far as like what he thought was real and all that, and that caused him to like basically like, um, forsake forsake the symbiote in, in order to um, protect protect his son Dylan. It's like af- after the end of the arc, so two volumes in, it's like it's like that's that's kind of where for the Venom series, that's kind of where we are. It's like and there's a, oh and there's also this cult that's looking to um it's like you know imbue um Carnage with the powers of this it's like of of um of Null's dragon the Grendel. It's like, and that's kind of where we are with um, Absolute Carnage, which I might say was uh, was a fantastic work of art from Ryan Stegman. I mean, he's become uh, one of my favorite artists within uh, the Marvel um, the Marvel organization, and he's done a fantastic job with the Venom series and uh, just seeing uh, his artwork in Absolute Carnage and what he's done with Spider-Man and other characters that we're going to be discussing uh, around this story. Like, I, I really dig this guy, and I really like to see him uh, do more uh, do more um, uh, series in the future, like with other characters and other books. But, yeah, as we dive into Absolute Carnage, like, I, I really did... Um, enjoy this storyline I, I didn't think necessarily it was like you know a redo or reimagining of maximum carnage but it did rekindle and show just how maniacal uh cletus cassidy is and once he has that symbiote you know bonded with him just how much damage he can do across the marvel you know universe yeah it's like I, i'm with you on on stegman's like abilities as an artist like i I'm, i mean i wasn't too keen on him like for his for, First couple times I, I encountered him, like working on stuff like Fantastic Four and like and like in Wolverine, but um he's but it's like he he does um really lean into the horror um aspects of this, it's like like of this event because it's if if there's one thing that that I'm absolutely Carnage has going for it, it's that it does try to try to be um a lot more horrific, it's like um than your mm-hmm. than your average Marvel event in the sense that you know you've got it's like it leans into like the the unreality of Car- Carnage's look and the uh, it's like and his um but and his symbiote um created hench it's like henchmen as well, but the uh, basic idea behind Maximum Car sorry Absolute Carnage mm-hmm. yeah is that in order to, that is that um with with um Cletus and the Carnage symbiote like now aware of it's like of Null it's like they want they figure like hey you know it's like we're gonna wake we're going to wake God up and he's going to come and kill everyone. That sounds awesome. Where's the logic in that? Yeah. Well, it's like, but in order to do that, they apparently need to um, collect the uh, codexes of all the other, um, like that the symbiotes have left over the years. So basically every character that has been infected um, by, by venom or um, another symbiote or like, like over the years in Marvel, it's like, well, they leave behind like a, uh, a codex, basically like a, a remnant of like their, of their symbiote symbiote infection in their spine and so like he so he's got and so carnage has to go and collect all these in order to it's like it's like in order to um like and once he's collected enough then he'll be able to um wake up he'll be able to wake wake up null and call him to earth yeah i thought that was like a fantastic addition into the lore about you know the symbiote this you you would think that you know uh with the creation of the symbiotes uh, in in the Marvel comic book universe, that they could just kind of bond to anybody, which they probably can. But there, a symbiote is a parasite, and it needs to latch on. And by a symbiote embedding uh, a little piece of itself into the host's DNA or in their spine, like it really gives you that sense that they're truly latched on. And even though a person might get rid of them or or get them off at some point, there's still a little piece behind to where if that symbiote were to ever come back it could easily slither its way in and latch on or bond to you and i really like how they added that aspect to the symbiote storyline because even though uh other heroes have worn symbiotes in the past they're not necessarily quote unquote rid of them because there's that little piece behind and then having carnage actually have this mission to go buy, uh, go back and extract those uh, pieces from either someone who's worn a symbiote for a day or worn a symbiote, you know, for many years, it just adds more, um, 
fear and more uh, fright to this story because, um, for instance, like Normie Osborn. Going I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. Normie Osborn, as you mentioned from uh, Amazing Spider Man, uh, the uh, A hundred. You know, just having him who wore the Carnage symbiote just for a little little bit of a period of time he's still affected by this and now like the the clock is ticking to protect these boys from this my um, um maniacal monster yeah it's like i mean and it also gives kind of like the gives us like, like an appreciative like hunt the mcguffin type thing like we gotta it's like we gotta go in and like you know stop stop carnage from getting like the most it's like the most um like desirable um codex specimen Specimens like the first, like most of the first issue, it's like is basically predicated around, it's like you know, like Spider-Man and 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 uh, Venom teaming up once they realize that oh crap, it's like if Carnage is gonna go after like the most desirable like Codex, he's gonna have to go after Norman Osborn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that leads them to like this um like at the, some cra- crazy fight sequence in um, Ravencroft where like Carn- Carnage is like the whole like. Like he's given, he's in symbiote to everyone, and you get a symbiote, and you get a symbiote, <laughs> so you get a symbiote too. It's like it's them, it's them versus like all the, uh, like all the crazy inmates, while also like facing off a Norman Osborn who is, who is crazy, who's basically like, crazy enough to the point where he now thinks that he's Cletus Cassidy instead of an actual Norman Osborn, which is a nice way to get around the fact that, hey, okay, we can get, we can have Carnage as, like, the big, we have Carnage as the big bad, and we have Norman Osborn as Cletus. So you get, like, Carnage and Cletus as almost separate characters. It's like, it's like, in this, it's like, in this event. So, but, but overall, it's like, I mean, it's like, I, I, I'm not sure if I, if I like this as much as you did, because, I mean, like, I like, I like the art. It's like, and the storyline was, was, for most part, I thought it was kind of fine. I mean, like it has that whole kind of like that whole Hunt the MacGuffin type type thing. But one of the things I kind of appreciate most about um, Kate's work is that how when he's when he's completely on his game, he can he can nail like the most outlandish stuff to um like to a real kind of like recognizable like like grounded human emotions, like in, in God Country and even in like even in his Marvel work to to a certain extent, like with me, not so much as in um, Thanos wins, but he's done, he's done good, doing a job of making um, Eddie, uh, Eddie Brock, like really relatable and understandable in his, it's like in his vent, in his, in his screen venom incarnation with, um, with the absolute carnage though, it's kind of like, it's, it feels to like say it's more given over to like spectacle. Like, you know, the big moments of, you know, Spider-Man and venom fighting against carnage and rape, Ravencroft. Oh, the Hulk gets the Hulk gets venomized. Um, it's like Eddie. It's like Eddie alone against against the symbiotes, and then like it. It's like Eddie. It's like Eddie and um. It's like like Eddie um like uh, against um a, a venom infused carnage at the very very end. If my, I guess like there there is kind of an attempt to basically uh to try and like ground some of this in the sense that you know like one of the, uh, the one dramatic through line I got with this was that. Like um, Eddie has been, Eddie hasn't told his his son Dylan that he's actually his son, because like his son Dylan thinks that Eddie's his um brother, and that his his dad was actually his that his he thinks that his um his um dad was is actually he thought the person he thought it was his dad was actually his granddad, so so and that's kind of like the uh, the one dramatic through line that I was that I felt that um Kate's Kate's was kind of invested in. Over the course of the series, even though it's like it doesn't get a lot of face time, like throughout, it's like maybe a little bit at the beginning and then at the very end as well. I mean, what what did you think, Myron? Yeah, I mean, um, like granite, like I did, I really did like this storyline. I did feel it was a little short, but you got to remember too, like um, I, I've been collecting these Venom comics, uh, the Donny Cates and uh, and Ryan Stegman new run, but I haven't really dove into them too hardcore. The last time I really kept up with Venom uh, was when Flash Thompson was Agent Venom, and mm-hmm. so and then I kind of fell off after that. But reading Absolute Carnage kind of re-exposed me uh, just to who Eddie Brock is and his relationship with Venom now, and and um, how he's grown as a character. Because I was really surprised and taken aback on he and Peter's relationship because I've always grown up knowing that, you know, 
Brock hated Peter because you know, um, you know, he felt he won up them, you know, at the bugle. He he hated Spider Man because he hated, you know, he felt he, you know, messed up his career. And both and the symbiote hated Spider Man, you know, has the hate for Spider Man for ditching him the way he did. So the both both Brock and and the Venom symbiote kind of had this disdain for Spider Man to where you know that became like uh, Spidey's like you know one of his greatest foes. Fast forward to the storyline, I see this kind of like friendship yet not necessarily good friend dynamic where they're meeting at the. Uh, at the coffee place in the beginning of the storyline and trying to come up with a game plan and, and what they need to do. And Eddie lays on the table about the codec, the codices, I should say that was like his plural for it. And just seeing how, when they're watching the news and they see all these bodies that carnage unearthed to remove the codices. And at that point, like Peter, Peter realizes, like, okay, we need to go. We need to work together. We need to do this. Uh, as you mentioned before, the first big idea was to go, um, quote unquote, rescue Norman Osborn from Ravencroft. And the whole thing about um, uh, Dylan being his son, it kind of took me aback too, because I was like, well, who, who did, who did Brock have a relationship with? And I totally forgot about uh, Anne, Anne Weying. So, like, I kind of like that dynamic where uh, Brock was trying to, he, he was tiptoeing the whole time through the story on telling Dylan who he is. But then he always tried to have that fatherly, uh, um, that fatherly um, attitude towards him, like trying to protect him, not only from the symbiotes, but, you know, uh, doing whatever is necessary to make sure that his son was okay and that he could you know eventually bond have a relationship with him and teach him you know uh what he needs to know about you know being a host for a symbiote and so i did feel like the very end of this book ended abruptly when you know the way his son found out who he was was hearing hearing him during a battle you know get get away from my son and i kind of felt that was a little bit less impactful than having that kind of like you know real moment where he actually sat down and you know told him i'm not actually your brother i'm actually your father uh and 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 i you know had this relationship blah 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 but the whole ride building up what you just said those exciting moments those horrific moments in which like the fight in Ravencroft or once they were able to finish the machine and get everybody back to the warehouse, you think they were safe, but carnage ended up infiltrating uh, the warehouse anyway and causing havoc while Captain America, Ben Grimm and Wolverine were still under getting their codices removed. Um, those were like really exciting uh, pages to read and the artwork and the layout in those fight sequences were amazing. <laughs> Agreed. It's like, and yeah, both about the uh, the fight scenes and about this the um the abrupt end to this like to this event as well. Especially with um Dylan pulling that like I'm going to disintegrate Carnage um stuff right there. Right. Because okay, because also the thing is I want to want to mention, and I guess I kind of want to segue into talking about the like the tie-ins to this is that in in the Venom in the Venom tie-in issues you get a you get a little bit more about that. It's like you get to see um. You get to see Dylan pull that um, symbiote disintegrating stuff a bit early. It's like a bit earlier on. It's like, and also you get that um, that kind of like stuff you talk about, like with, with Eddie talking about, like talking to Dylan about how, oh, yeah, I'm your, uh, like I'm your dad, and this is how things are going to be. It's like that's that's something that's kind of that 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 hits at the uh, in the final issue of the Venom tie-in issues. In fact, the uh, it's like the uh, the tie-in issues um for like in in the regular Venom series are pretty good. I mean, they're not, they're not to the point where like, I kind of like, I kind of feel like if the best stuff is kind of like when, um, like when Jonathan Hickman does his, um, stuff like within, uh, infinity, it's like where you just like read, you read issues, issue of Avengers, then issue of new Avengers. And then you read issue of infinity, stuff like that, where like it reads seamlessly with like in alongside the, uh, event. It's like this, they, these issues, I'm um, told, told a pretty solid, um, tale about what, what was going on with with Dylan? It's like and with Dylan, the other symbiotes. It's like and also the Maker. 
which um hey Myron, like any questions about who the maker was and what his deal is so so that, that that did throw me throw me for a loop at first because when it, when the maker was introduced into the storyline he was stretching and I'm like what is this Reed and then sure enough like it was later elaborated that yeah this is Reed Richards from an evil Reed Richards from an alternate universe and even though I never read it I assumed this spawned from uh, the last Secret Wars is that correct the maker is he is Reed Richards he's ultimate reed richards oh ultimate from the ultimate storylines yes oh no way okay okay yeah because he became he he became a villain in that it's like in that universe as it's like as things went on it's like and um so was like, this a result of ultimatum no that's not we we don't have ultimatum blame for this um bendis actually did a whole storyline called ultimate doomsday that eventually like, ended with the revelation that um Old, that Reed Richards has basically just gone off the deep end, and wow. then um, after that, Jonathan Hickman used um, decided to have him like run kind of like an evil future foundation. It's like in the pages of the Ultimates. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So he's been kind of like he's kind of like a Reed Richards, like you know, kind of like w- without it's like without the uh, the family, but the family core or the morals to uh, to guide him. Like so, the, just uh, pure cold calculating logic. Exactly, and one of the things I liked about the end of the, the end of um, it's like it, like I mean he plays he has a slightly bigger role to play in the tie-in issues as he's tr- like having to like um, take the um, hold down hold on the fort at it's like in his lab like keep to keep Normie and Dylan protected while some of the symbiotes um, raise like attack it's like attack the lab, but um, at the very end though it it's revealed that oh it's like he's been trying. He's been trying to bring back the Ultimate Universe, and one of the things he's actually been able to to bring bring from it is the synthetic ven- Venom symbiote from like from Ultimate Spider-Man. So that's why, and and I wish they kind of explained this in this current uh, this absolute carnage story. Did it ever has it, did it ever get revealed why he was trying to collect the cod the codices instead of destroying them? Oh, um, it's like. Oh, the maker or Reed? Yeah, the, yeah, the it's, maker. Yeah, it's like, I don't think it was. I don't think it was specifically said. I think he was probably. I think he was. He was. He was. Um. He was basically. It's revealed that he was studying them as kind of like a mean to tran to to uh, tra- to a transit between universes. So I think oh. that he was. He was looking at it that way. Okay, because like, I, I mean, I, I didn't hate that aspect, but I just felt a little bit more should have been flushed out where, you know, the, the symbiotes start gathering around the device and they're trying to like, oh, why are, they, why are they, you know, huddled over the device where they end up finding out like he was actually storing the codices instead of destroying it. And then that gave Eddie like, you know, the, the ability to go through, uh, break open the, the seal and absorb all the symbiotes and all all the host minds and basically be a hive venom, so to speak. And it was cool, mm-hmm. but I was like, oh, that's that's a pretty easy setup. Right. It's like, yeah, it's like, and it's like, it was, yeah, but it, I mean, it was, and then in the end, it's like, yeah, he, yeah it was kind of like, it was kind of a loss for the, for the maker right there. And until he like, until like that, the reveal in like the tie-in issues where oh I got I managed to get the uh, synthetic venom symbiote and then you find out that he's talking to um, the Council of Reeds, which is another um, concept from Hickman's um, F- Fantastic Four run, where it's like basically like the multiverse has um, all these versions of Reed Richards that have kind of like um, forsaken their families who basically realize like hey you know there are greater concerns out there than just you know being a fa- a good family man because like, we're here to uh, solve everything. And that you know, well they, that while that um, it was revealed to have fallen apart in the course of Hickman's run, now that um, the universe has been rebuilt in the wake of Secret Wars, the, it's kind of like assumed that okay, now they're all there's a new this, in this new universe. There's a new Council of Reeds from all these other universes, and that the Maker he's not part of them yet, because in order to um, become part of them. He's got to go and bring back the ultimate universe. So, so are these Council of Reeds more organized than the Council of Ricks? Yes. <laughs> just, just yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, I know what you're going out there, but yeah, it's like it's this is this is a, this is a full, wholly corporate owned like um vert like um institution of like one one guy just like running the universe. So yes, it is it is far more 
like organized in the Council of Ricks. Oh, uh, that's that's crazy. Yeah, I've always, uh, I've always, you know, I've always liked the Fantastic Four. Like growing up, like I love their comic books and and you know watch the cartoons growing up. And yeah, just to hear Reed Richards kind of go uh, maniacal and as the maker i was like yeah that's a that's a different twist but it does make sense because i mean he's one of the smartest minds in the marvel universe and if you and if you throw away sue ben and johnny and have nothing left all he has is his science and his logic exactly i think it makes him makes him a good foil for like for this series i'm looking forward to see what kate's case has planned with them yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of wish they kind of, and I hope maybe later on it might tie in later on, kind of fleshing out more of like that that story of why he was trying to collect and you know for for like a bigger picture kind of thing. But um, yeah, I mean it was a uh, it was interesting to get reintroduced to reintroduced to some of those uh, some of those characters because like I've heard of the maker, never really read about it, but uh, um, that was kind of like a reintroduction right there and then uh one of one of the scenes i totally forgot i wanted to talk about was the mac gargan and miles morales scene because oh yeah it's like it's, i i've seen the same about miles morales yeah I, I totally forgot like uh mac had the venom symbiote at one point and that was just an interesting scene where they were both fighting those hordes of uh carnages together and mac was like trying to you know bounce out like oh, sorry kid you know you're on your own and you know venom comes in steps in you know throws his ass back into the pile like you are going to fight but just seeing uh you know it was you're right in norman osborne yeah it was it was it was crazy to see that scene where you know norman does extract uh extract the code the codex straight from his spine but it it, it it hardened my, or softened my heart when I saw uh, Miles get dragged away, and I was like, "Oh, don't don't turn Miles." But the sequence between, I think it was issue two and issue three, where you kind of see Miles getting drugged down through this darkness, like he like he fell through like a pool of black, and you see like the red swirls that he's getting swallowed up by the symbiote. I thought that was just a dope visualization of how he was being absorbed, and. Um, yeah, it was just a. It was just an awesome sequence. Yeah, it's like that. That's kind of like one of those scenes you see, like, oh, Miles getting um, like dragged in by all the symbiotes, and then like for his, his the color in his word bubbles to change. It's like, oh crap, he's been he's been absorbed by the symbiotes. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh man, what's gonna happen there? Well, that's actually part of the part of the tie-ins that I read because um, Ab- Absolute Carnage actually tied in with like a couple of different series that I read, include. And like the issue, the Miles Morales tie-in issues, they were their own miniseries, um, but they were actually written by the guy who writes the regular, um, like uh, Miles Morales series, um, Saladin Ahmed. And so I kind of figured, okay, well if he's writing these, then chances are these are probably going to be relevant to his overall like plans for the character. And you know, it's like maybe they are, but the, th- the, the three issues that I read, it's like you know, I think they were, they, they kind of played out as bad as about as you'd expect in the sense that. You know, it's like the first issue was just kind of like showing you what Miles was getting up to before, like before the Carnage um stuff um went down. He was like he was fighting the the um the Scorpion, like believe it or, or not. But then um after he gets absorbed by the uh, by the symbiote, I mean he's like it's kind of like the symbiote is kind of like riding sh- it's kind of like r- riding in the driver's seat through his it's like through his personality. But then you've got a uh, Miles just you know like trying to fight back, but he's not able to like to pull. To pull it off until it's like um it's like he's been asked to kill um J. Jonah Jameson. It's like once that so once that happens, then he's able to try and fight back. And then he's also gotta fight help try and um try and um like fight off the uh it's like the other symbiote he's been he's in partnering with, like some serial killer to um like like say that hey, you know, you can fight this off as well. And um eventually it's like he it's like but then when he um when he's able to fight off the symbiote, the symbiote that Miles was who was controlling Miles jumps onto um, J. Jonah Jameson. Mm. Yeah, and so then when Miles is able to yank him off that, he realizes that okay, in order to like, you know, I can't just let this thing run around. I've got to um, like take it on myself. So it's like he realizes that he can he can fight against it. So he basically he assumes it, and so he, he, that's when he goes back. And that's when you we, we kind of fight, find him fighting in in the hordes. It's like you know, back like in issue four. It's like, and that's when like uh, you know, Eddie um, ta- Eddie takes him out. So, so like it was, so it it was fine. It was it was a nice nice enough tie-in. It's like 
I wouldn't say it's, it's absolutely not an essential read. It's like as far as I sorry as far as I kill. Kind of same kind of goes for the the tiny issues I read of Amazing Spider Man, which um like I've like I've been reading. I really like the current the current series, and um the thing is like they're like this current volume volume six like there's there's like one issue where it's kind of like oh it's Peter it's like you know Peter and uh, Mary Jane they're ch- they're kind of like um. They're kind of making nice before Mary Jane has to go off to the uh, West Coast, like for an acting job, and it's just kind of like oh, the you know, your usual Spider-Man like you know, romantic complications and all. And then there's the uh, Red Goblin um, one shot that included at the end just to pad things out, which is basically an anthology of Norman Osborn Red Goblin related stuff, which is all right. But the uh, the two issues here that tie into um, Absolute Carnage. Well, they're the two that are issued by a sensible regular artist, Ryan Otley, and um, you kind of figure that he that that he wanted to, to be in on these because, like, hey, you know, it's like you want me to draw Spider-Man fighting Carnage, I am totally there for that. So, but these uh, two issues basically focus on um, on the scene where um, Spider-Man has to fight off um, like Norman Osborn, like I think it's like in issues four and five. So it's basically it's there. For what it's worth, they're like they're a good, you know, like hey, Spider-Man, like you know, gets beaten down, but he gets back up, you know, type of story, like enlivened by um by Otley's um fantastic art, yeah. But the other thing is that um they're also used to um further the subplot of the this mysterious demonic creature um Kindred, who has been like haunting Spider-Man, haunting the pages of the series with like some unnamed vendetta against Spider-Man, and it's kind of like, okay, well, they. The uh, like, I'm um, writing Nick Spencer. Apparently, he really wants you to think that this that Kindred is actually um, Harry Osborn. Um, but uh, it's one of those things where it's kind of like, because he really wants you to think that. It's like it's probably not going to be Harry Osborn. That's all. That's all I can say. That's that's all I can add from the uh, like from the from the tie-ins here. But you know, it's like as far. But hey, I was buying Spider, Amazing Spider-Man like before. Like absolute carnage ticked off, and these issues, you know, they don't really add a lot to, like, like to the uh, overall story or absolute carnage itself. But you know, they're fine in terms of like, you know, hey, you want to have Ryan Otley draw some kick-ass fight scenes between Spider-Man and Carnage? Well, hey, these I, I will admit that these these issues do kind of deliver on that on that promise. Right on. Yeah, and I guess like the last thing I want to talk about as far as tie-ins go, and this is probably like, the best of the tie-ins that was the immortal hulk um like tie-in to like absolute carnage i mean myron do you do you you follow the immortal hulk at all i do not actually that's a series i don't really pick up regularly okay because it's it's been it's been pretty good i mean after it's gotten gotten over the the initial hurdle of like hey it's kind of like a hulk hulk series that's infused with horror only it's not really scary but then it's been shown that like writer um, Al Ewing has like a, he's got like a he has a very specific Hulk story that he wants to tell and he's been doing it um, pretty well so far. Um, this tie-in issue it's a it's just a one shot um, to the uh, Absolute Carnage um, saga, but it's also something that it's kind of like it's very um, deep into like the current run on on Immortal Hulk as well because like basically it takes place after Volume Four. It, and between volume five of the immortal Hulk and um, basically involves it also involves, it starts off with the Bruce like in a black room talking to talking to someone from a from a first person perspective like you can see, you see Bruce talking to someone but you don't know who it is and so he's just he, he's just like bringing this person up to speed on what's been going on in the in the current Hulk series and it's it's like and, and, and it's done pretty pretty well like um well I've had issues with like artist Philippe Andrade. It's like to have his art contents to come off as unfinished. He's he he displays like this kind of like quirky, quirky weird sketchy style here that I think worked worked really really well in making this seem like a uh, like a really weird psychological um, story. But then like, as as Bruce is like bringing bringing this this un, unseen person up to see what's been going on because you find out that oh after um. After General Ross was um, ripped from his grave at, um, it's like in, it's like in DC, it's like then you and he was dumped in that that mass grave with all that, that we that we found and like hear about the first issue. We found out that the Hulk was the one who called them, who alerted the media about this. Uh, 
Okay, so that's why they that's why they were there. Yeah, and um, and then as things go as things go on, we get we get uh, we get like current personalities like um like Joe Fixit like giving his impression on things. We get the regular Hulk, um like like give like wondering like you know why it's like why everyone hurt hurt Hulk and like why puny better not stop talking, and also um the Devil Hulk, um who was like basically in the driver's seat throughout this series talking about things as well oh and there's also um in the real world there's betty who is like like who's been mutated into some kind of like um like red-skinned um like claw-toothed um like winged winged gamma monstrosity it's like she like she she's kind of like like just like someone someone resents bruce for like making making her life into this kind of thing oh and rick jones who was ripped from the abomination skin in the pre- previous volume is now regenerating in a bathtub in like a motel six. So, wow. Yeah. But, um, but there's all, but it's, it's basically like a, kind of like a sampler for like the immortal Hulk. It's kind of like, you just see what, what Ewing has been up to here. And it's, and I think it's really, I think it's really good. I mean, it doesn't necessarily add a whole lot to it, but it does also ultimately uh, add some context to one of the, um, to the, um, to the, the events, um, like big money shot moments. Cause like, remember how, Hey Myron, do you remember how um like we get like the like like the Hulk going, We are Venom. Yeah, that was uh that was pretty that was a pretty amazing uh scene right there where uh Venom Venom leaves Brock. He says, I told you, Eddie, uh if you're not strong enough to do this, I will find someone who will and hops on to Bruce Banner as, you know, as uh Carnage is, you know, trying to dig into him and then when you see you know, venomized Hulk. You're like, oh man, that is such a, that is just such a dope money shot, and that's going to be an awesome real, fight. Man. Yeah, that was that was crazy. Like Venom Smash. Like it was, just seeing that was just kind of like a little nerdgasm. Yeah, it's like, and if if you want to learn the, if you want to learn how um Venom was able to like infect like someone who's got like multiple personalities running around in his head. Then this the mortal this mortal Hulk um absolute carnage one shot. This is how you do it. It's like oh, it's right. like I said, it's it, it's not something that's like crucial to the uh, overall like story for the mortal Hulk, but it's a great example of like what what the series um do, does best. So, All right. Yeah. So I guess oh I guess overall it's like you know like I I guess like I liked it in this um absolute carnage as a whole even though it's like i, I don't think it's kind of like it felt like kind of more of like a regular storyline of the series like on steroids rather than just like i guess a proper event oh yeah i mean it it for me it was like you know good solid b probably close to a b plus like i really enjoyed it but you know by the end i see the big picture being set up with Noel finally be awake uh Noel being awakened and flying towards earth I expect this to maybe be like I'm hoping it, they're setting this up to be like a Marvel, uh, Marvel Universe tie-in kind of event, or if this is going to just stay contained within the books of uh, Venom or Spider-Man or um, even kind of like an Absolute Carnage, you know, Part Two, so to speak. But um, yeah, I'm really excited to see how they uh, queue up Noel and his involvement uh, within these characters' lives. Yeah, it's like I'm. I'm certain that you know when that when Noel finally arrives on Earth, that um, it's been the series has been set up to be um, another. It's that that has basically been set up to be a very big deal. So I imagine that like this will be there'll be another like event. It's like you know like basically to herald to herald his arrival, assuming that um, it's like that um, Case has been able to maintain like the level of quality he, he's been able to show in the regular Venom series. So, but overall it's like, I mean, I like like absolute carnage, but it's like, I don't think it like, quite kind of nailed like the, uh, like the human and dramatic underpinnings that I, that um, Kate's has delivered in the, uh, in, in the regular Venom series. Like I'm looking forward to seeing what he's got planned for like the next arc, which is called Venom Island. So it's like sounds like it's like like um, Eddie and the symbiote are gonna have to like um like embrace their survi- survival skills and hey um Mark Bagley's gonna be illustrating that arc so I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how he does how he does with that. I am too because uh, you know um, I did see uh, I did see a couple snippets uh, from that issue and you know I just want to shout out to Mark Bagley who's like one of my favorite you know 
Spider-Man. Uh, he's one of my favorite artists of all time, but he's one of my favorite Spider-Man uh, artists who's ever graced the pages of um, Amazing Spider-Man and and other Spider-Man related books. But he is and ultimate, ultimate Spider-Man over in this corner. Oh, yep. Thank you. An ultimate Spider-Man. One of one of my favorite one of my favorite series. But he, you know, co-created Carnage and and brought him into uh, the world for us. So I I, I often. Um, you know, when reading Absolute Carnage, like, you know, I often think back like, man, we wouldn't have this character if not for, you know, Amazing Spider-Man 361 uh, introducing him into uh, the universe. And then, you know, I think during this run of comics, there were like special inserts, I think, in... Um, I think Absolute Carnage number one with like a sketch by Bagley, and I would have so loved to have gotten one of those. But, yeah, I really... Uh, I really love that dude's artwork and, you know, hope to see him do some more uh, Spider-Man related projects even after his run on uh, Venom here. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's like, I'm thinking we're, we're both like looking forward, right, really looking forward to seeing like, you know, where the st stories from this um, series go, I guess like with slightly different levels of enthusiasm, I guess. Yep. All oh, right. So John, um, any thoughts on your end about any of this? Mm, I don't know. Uh, it sounds pretty exciting. I don't know. Did you guys, um, you make a recommend on this? I I do because um, this this book came out around the same time I was like buying a uh, X Men House of X and and Powers of X. So it was kind of hard to keep up financially wise to buy all these books and all these variants uh, at the same time. But if you're a fan of like Spider Man or even you know, a fan of the symbiotes, like it's five issues. Um, they've have plenty of reprints if uh, if you want to get the individualized comic books. But when you see how Ryan Stegman draws Venom and does like uh, um, horror, like kind of like sequences, like it fits it fits the character and it fits the vibe of you know Venom. Period. So um, I do recommend picking it up if not just to. Uh, experience story, but just for the artwork, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I think it's mainly worth reading. Like if you're already reading the Venom um, series, it's like as far as like you know big like earth shattering Marvel stuff, maybe not. But um, but overall, it's like you know it's like it's. I mean, I think it's fine. It's middle of the road for um, like overall Marvel Marvel events that I've read. But um, you know, it's like, but like, but it's a decent, but it's a decent event um, for like for Venom, and it's absolutely crucial to what Kate is doing with on um, the character so uh -huh. yep um yeah so that's kind of cool um do you know what you're gonna be talking about next time next time we're going back to the inexhaustible well of content that is star wars i'm gonna be talking about um dr afra and like her ongoing series and um well myron i'd like to thank you for, co for coming on like the show again hey, again thank you for always having me and i Loved, you know, just talking, you know, Spider-Man geekness with you guys. Yeah, and it's like, hey, we'll probably see about having you back on again, like, once those um, X-Men collections um, start coming out. So. Oh, oh, most definitely. Like, after after that last run, I was like, I gotta take a break because I can't be dropping 120 bucks, like, every week. So No uh, one can, which is why <laughs> we, need, we need to tell everyone what they should be buying. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, this time I'm gonna wait for, the, you know, the collected editions of the Dawn of X storyline. Alright, well, All right, and Sounds great. All right. We'll catch you next time on Comic Picks by the Glick. All right. Laters. <laughs>